That's what's bothering me. Here's a first grade textbook. Look what they tell the kids in first grade. Boys and girls, Earth has changed much since its formation four and a half billion years ago. Now just hold on a minute. Is the Earth four and a half billion years old? No, but if you tell that to a first grader, he's going to believe you. First graders believe everything you tell them. They believe bananas are moldy spider legs. <laughs> I did, okay. And then tell them again in second grade. Since its formation four and a half billion years ago, Earth has changed. Down here it says, life too has evolved on Earth. This word evolved is a very tricky word. There are six different meanings to the word, okay? So I've learned, I've done 87 debates and over, I think, 7,000 now radio and TV call-in talk shows. I've learned how to win the debate on evolution in the first five minutes. It is so easy. If somebody says, do you believe in evolution? I simply say, what do you mean? Well, you, well, you know, evolution. Oh, no, I don't know. What do you mean? Which, one, which meaning are you talking about? Are you talking about cosmic evolution? That is the origin of time, space, and matter, the Big Bang? No, I don't believe in that. Are we talking about chemical evolution? Because according to the Big Bang theory, the Big Bang made hydrogen. Okay, then how did we get these other elements? Do you want me to believe that uranium evolved from hydrogen? They'll say, well, yeah, in stars, you get fusion. Well, you can't fuse past iron. Check it out. So how do we get uranium? Huh? You want me to believe in stellar and planetary evolution, that the stars and planets form? Nobody's ever seen a, a star form. We see stars blow up all the time. It's called a nova or a supernova, if it's a big one. But we've never seen one form. And yet there's enough stars out there right now that we know about that everybody on planet Earth can individually, personally own 11 trillion of these stars to yourself. Those are the ones we know about. We don't know about the ones that we don't know about. <laughs> then there'd have to be organic evolution. That's the origin of life. Nobody has a clue how life can get started from non-living material. Do you want me to believe that living things came from... you want me to believe in spontaneous generation proven wrong 200 years ago? No. I don't believe in any of those four. Maybe you're talking about macroevolution. That's where an animal changes into a different kind of animal. Nobody's ever seen that. Nobody's ever seen a dog produce a non-dog. I mean, you may get a big dog or a little dog, I understand, but you're going to get a dog, okay? Every time. And it could be the dog, the wolf, and the coyote had a common ancestor. I wouldn't argue about that. But I'll tell you what, every little kid knows they're the same kind of animal. I'll show you. Is anybody in here five or six years old? Who's five or six? How old are you? Six. What's your name? Hmm? Rachel? Rachel? Rachel, why don't you take a test here, Rachel. Here we have a dog, a wolf, a coyote, and a banana. Which one is not like the others? The banana. Very good. Let's give her a hand. All right. Amen. <laughs> we have college professors. Can't figure that one out. Mm -hmm. yeah. See, the Bible says they bring forth after their kind. See, if they can bring forth... They're the same kind. Simple definition. Can they bring forth? A dog and a wolf can mate and bring forth. A dog and a banana cannot. Now see, Charlie Darwin wrote a book called The Origin of Species. And how the Christian church got lost in the 1800s and didn't catch that, I don't know. But they didn't catch what's happening. They're changing the definition. If they'd have stuck with the word kind, we never would have had this dumb evolution theory permeating our society. They bring forth, they're the same kind. Anyway. Lastly, we have what's called microevolution. This is variations within the kinds. Ah, now this one happens. So if you want to talk about variations, I agree, they happen. That is actually science. The first five meanings of the word are purely religious. So I'm telling you folks, if you're going to get into a discussion on evolution, you better define what you're talking about, or you'll never get any place. Because when I say the word evolution, I'm thinking of these five up here, but when the atheist says the word evolution, he's thinking of number six. And he doesn't understand how I can't see it, and I don't understand how he does see it, because we haven't defined the terms. That's the problem. Anyway, the teachers are told in their teacher's manuals, be sure to stress that the earth is billions of years old. Make sure the kids believe this. Now, I happen to be a little old-fashioned. I think in science class, we should be teaching science. You know, things we can observe and study and test and demonstrate. Science. Things like the first law of thermodynamics which tells us matter cannot be created or destroyed. Well, everything's made out of matter, so if matter cannot be created or destroyed, then how did the world get here? We're here, you know. 
So that leaves two choices. Somebody made the world or the world made itself. There's no other choice. Well, there are a few out there on the lunatic fringe who will tell you, we're not really here at all. We just think we're here. Okay, well, you can forget about those folks. We're here, okay? So either somebody made the world like the Bible says, God did it, or the world made itself like the humanists believe. Well, if the world just made itself, how could this happen? Oh, the devil thought about that for a long time. And finally, one day, he came up with the Big Bang Theory. How many have ever heard of the Big Bang Theory? I was on the airplane years ago, flying from Dallas to San Francisco, the land of the fruits and the flakes. And I happened to sit right next to a professor from Berkeley, UCAL Berkeley. I don't know if you folks down here have ever heard of Berkeley or not, but Berkeley is not a Bible college. <laughs> I got to speak last year at Berkeley for 10 hours, the most hostile audience I've ever had in my life. It was so fun. <laughs> it was a blast, brother. I'm doing it again in April, two more months. Berkeley, yay, bring them on. 138 professors refuse to debate me. So I'll just go straighten them out by myself. Okay. The guys are a lot smarter than I am, but I slaughter them because I'm right, they're wrong. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, would you want to defend the idea that we all came from a rock? Mm -hmm. yeah. Anyway, I'm sitting on the airplane right next to this professor from Berkeley, and we started talking about creation and evolution. Everybody I sit by on the airplane wants to talk about that, so I talk about it with him. He said he, be he believed in evolution. I said, yes, sir, I figured that. You have to to teach at Berkeley. I said, tell me, sir, if you believe in evolution, how did the world get here? He said, oh, it came from the Big Bang. I said, really? I'd like to hear about this. He said, you're a science teacher and you've never heard of the Big Bang? I said, oh, yes, sir, I've heard a lot about the Big Bang. And I believe in the Big Bang, but my Big Bang's a lot different than yours. I said, you tell me about your Big Bang, and then I'll tell you about my Big Bang. And so the professor went off on one of those answers that looked like it came straight from the textbook. He said, well, Hoven, I believe about 18 or 20 billion years ago, that's a long time, all the matter in the universe. Now, that's a lot of stuff. Hey, by the way, do you know the word universe comes from two Latin words? Uni, which means single, and verse means a spoken sentence. You know, we have verse and prose. Did you know we live in a single spoken sentence? God said, let there be. That'll preach, brother. There's a sermon right in there someplace, okay? And if you can't find it, you ain't got no preaching you at all, okay? <laughs> all the matter in the universe was concentrated into one very dense, very hot region that may have been much smaller than a period on this page. What? Everything in the universe squished into a dot, smaller than a period on a page. Wow. That's one crowded dot. And heavy, too. <laughs> hey, boys and girls, it ain't the first time it happened, either. This textbook says, after many billions of years, all the matter and energy will once again be packed into a small area, no bigger than the period at the end of the sentence. Then, another big bang will occur. It happens every 80 to 100 billion years. So you can forget about global warming. <laughs> We're going to get squished. <laughs> can you believe they cut down a tree to print that? <laughs> Where's Al Gore when you need him? Mm, that's what I want to know. <laughs> <laughs> now, the guy that wrote this book was brilliant. I couldn't believe how smart this guy was. He said, boys and girls, nothing really means nothing. You have to be at least that smart to write a book. He said, not only matter and energy would disappear, but also space and time. However, physicists theorize that from the state of nothingness, the universe began in a gigantic explosion. What? Yes, boys and girls, you see, one day, nothing exploded. And here we are. Oh, well, that explains it, yeah.